I'm so excited about this panel. I mean, we've, throughout the entire day, active versus passive seems to have come up in some shape or form in the panel. So it's really important that we have this one. We have a great panel of experts here. Uh, and yeah, we're talking about the shape of the ETF industry. Uh, and just some, some statistics to give you to sort of set uh, where we are in the space. Uh, the ETF industry manages over $7 trillion thousands of listed funds globally. Uh, according to Moody's, index funds will overtake active management in the US by 2021. That's certainly a global trend that we're seeing. So Fanny, I'm going to pick on you because you're right next to me. Um, sorry about that. You chose to sit here. <laughs> but so obviously, a lot of factors got us to this place. But if you could pick one overriding reason how we've gotten to such a gigantic mm -hmm. ETF industry, what do you think it is? Well, thank you very much. And that was very interesting to listen to the session before because uh, we are big believer that there is a good combination of active and passive and not to opposite them as state. But having said that, if you look at the, the markets in which we evolve, obviously we do live in a very challenging uh, market environment. Oh, I'm not uh, <laughs> disclosing something which is unusual to you, but I mean, when I'm looking at the, the 10 years yield, I mean, you're overall almost flattish, huh, guys, at 45 uh, basis points yields. I mean, the Euro government bond is negative, uh, the US one are still leaning positive, but we are challenged, uh, the overall asset management industry, on how we make yields to our clients. On the top of it, we do have high uh, regulatory and uh, uh, pressure environment with MIFID implementation getting to force the RDR in the UK. And that's putting a lot of pressure on the overall industry on where to find yields, what is the cost for those yields, and actually what are the costs associated to it, the transparency, etc. Um, if we exclude that, I would say, macroeconomic and regulatory environments, there is as well a growing demand from the distributors and as well from the end clients to find cheap, comprehensive, cost-efficient product that they overall very well understand. And for more distributors moving forward, a question on how to combine those aspects. And finally, there are new ways of distributing financial products, such as the platforms that are expanding very well in the UK. And actually, um, I would even say a new generation of consumer of financial habits, even though this is not a big form right now, when we talk about the millennials, the digitalization effects, but still, this is something to take into consideration. So all in all, there is, I will say, a global concern and a, a global, um, I will say, demand for cost-efficient, risk-efficient product. And this is where ETF is a good solution towards that. Danny, I'm actually going to push back on one word that you use. Absolutely. And, and we can see where we take this uh, um, towards. You talked about gigantic ETF markets, mm -hmm. but uh, actually the runway is even uh, uh, much, much mm. bigger because if you think about the penetration rate of ETF versus the size of the underlying market, the number for equities is 4% globally and the number for fixed income is less than 1% globally. So uh, yes, it has come a long way in the case of Europe, helped by regulation, helped by investors' demand for cost-efficient products. Uh, growth of indexing strategy ETF in particular has been double digit for the last five years or so, but we expect this to continue for many years to come just because uh, the penetration uh, rate is still so low and the need for indexing ETF as part of your portfolio is significant. I think that 4%, I think that would surprise a lot of people just because we do continue mm -hmm. to have this passive debate, you know, is it overtaking things? Rory, what, did, what does it take to get that percentage point higher? What is it gonna take for increased adoption? Well, I think building on both these points in, in advance, I think the, if you go back to kind of first principles in the ETF industry, why, what, what, what has driven the growth? I think we'd all kind of sign up to that. In essence, it was around a liquidity proposition, a transparency proposition, the fact that you've got line-by-line -line security identification in the portfolio. You've got a performance proposition in the sense that basically they track the funds and they deliver pretty good tracking versus the core benchmark. And then you had a very significant value for money proposition whereby ETFs by and large in all jurisdictions is a low cost attractive proposition versus some of the other alternatives. And all of that kind of came together at different points in time. Uh, the other point I would highlight is also at any time you've seen a crisis in the markets, and I know this from my time in previous organization, 2008, trying to uh, you know, build the iShares business at the time, um, but each time you've had a crisis in financial services, many of those crises have resulted from 
lack of transparency, mis-selling, a poor value for money proposition, and ETFs have always stood up pretty well in that situation. So coming out of the crisis of 2008, you saw a pretty significant inflows into ETFs both in Europe and in the US. Um, now, recently in Australia, you've had the World Commission, you've had a crisis there, you've got a, a turn on in relation to kind of uptick in ETF uh, appetite and demand, et cetera. So the category has been pretty robust in terms of the value proposition it offers, not just for intermediary investors or retail investors, but also for institutional investors. And we, we, we see that continuing. Now, to the, some of the conversations this morning, the active versus passive, it's not actually an A versus B conversation, because ultimately in asset management, every decision is an active decision. And so what you're looking at is you've got to distinguish between portfolio management in a fund, so an active manager picking stocks versus a passive manager, and there's a, some element of a debate there. If the active manager delivers alpha and delivers it on a consistent basis, they'll get paid for that, but it's their job to demonstrate that. What ETFs have done as they've grown is they've shone that spotlight and they've raised the bar. So the active manager that was benchmark hugging and not delivering the alpha and charging a full fee for that, that active manager, as you once said this morning in the panel, is, is under threat. And that's, that's, and that's probably appropriate. But ultimately what's happening now is ETFs are becoming larger in terms of the quantum of AUM on a per fund basis. They're now being used as beta building blocks mm -hmm. for a wide variety of portfolio right. management strategies and asset allocation strategies. And you've got an active asset allocation there over on top of that and positioning ETFs towards delivering outcome-oriented investors for wealth investors, for high net worth individuals, for institutions, and for various of other entities. Right. So that growth is going to continue. Right. Fanny, are you, are you seeing sort of that area of growth as well? No, I do agree with Rory, actually. But uh, I would even go one step further, saying that um, the ETF is getting commoditized in terms of the uses. If you look back at the ETF industry 10 years ago in Europe, mostly that was tactically used by some of the fund of fund manager to access one specific market. And obviously, the growth of that industry, where it's still 4%, uh, do you agree? So we have still very high growth prospect. The growth of this industry is mutually beneficial for all of the investors. We do see now, and if you look at the European industry, ETFs are now used from sovereign investors, from fund of fund, from corporate pensions, from retail investors, from distributors. And the question is, how do they build comprehensive portfolio that do make value for the investors, actually? The question is much more, how do you combine the strategy with the active strategy, with the passive strategies, and what are actually, as Rory said, uh, the active investments you put on the top of it? And this is also as ETF provider, but as asset manager, or I would say responsibility to accompany you and actually to explain to you how to combine it best, whether it is active and passive, whether for some specific return generation, passive can be a good instrument, whether to access some markets or because of the, I would say, investment horizon of your clients, active is still making some benefits out of it. So the big question that we have nowadays is whether with our institutional clients or distribution partners or networks, is how do we help them actually navigating through that challenging environment? What is the best investment vehicle? How to access those returns that they need to deliver? When you're a, return, a retail investor, you still want to put your savings somewhere and you want returns out of your savings. When you are an institutional investor, you need to pay as well rents. Uh, you need to make sure you deliver returns for your clients. How do, you, how do we build up together some comprehensive portfolios? This is where the question lies. And all of the instruments, active and passive, can generate great stuff. When I look at the debate ESG and index fund at uh, the previous session, actually ESG is a revolution. Whether we want it or not, this is a revolution. This is a revolution in all of our, in the society, for sure. And we saw it in London today with some, I will say, uh, demonstration and strikes, but as well in the investments, actually. Right. And, and these are actually big debates where, and big topics where Obviously, we need to help you guys to make sure we build up the comprehensive solution so that you can address that topic as well. well I, I definitely think you know we'll, we'll get to ESG and some of these these strategies that are growing in popularity. Mm -hmm. But I think it maybe is a good way to sort of put some parameters on active versus passive because those words themselves. Because I know you have a specific view on if mm -hmm. you know the ETF industry being a passive industry. That's not quite how you see it, right? Mm -hmm. Precisely. There's one thing that I would love this panel to get across today is that there is no such a thing as passive in investing in its uh, entirety. I want to pick up on what Rory talked about in that all investment decision is an active decision. And oftentimes some of that involves 
actively deciding which index mm -hmm. to use okay. in your portfolio. Uh, we have done some study within um, uh, BlackRock trying to break down the uh, performance driver of all the fund managers monitored within uh, Morningstar and try to understand to what extent uh, it's uh, coming from single stock, single bond selection, to what extent it is coming from market exposure, to what extent it's coming from factor exposure. And what is really clear is that the alpha strategy of the past may well be the indexing ETF strategy of the future. And the best case in point is factor investing. So for a long time, the, the, the strategy of buying uh, small cap stocks to try to harvest the small cap uh, premium or buy cheap uh, value stocks to try to wait for value to mean revert. Those are strategies that alpha managers, they, they, they stick to and it has worked very well. But with better computing power and better data access, those strategies can be um, extracted and crystallized in a rule-based strategy, which can ultimately be indexed and, and replicated using ETFs. And that's why the divide between, I'm going to stop saying passive now, indexing <laughs> and alpha, the line between that is moving increasingly mm. closer, kind of towards the right with uh, greater transparency, with fee uh, uh, transparency as well. Think about MIFID and, 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 and also better data, better ability to index what used to be only accessed through uh, active uh, strategy. And I also want to pick up what Fanny talked about in terms of the portfolio approach is so important. What we have seen is is a, a revolution in the wealth uh, uh, sector, in the wealth uh, industry in Europe, uh, uh, catalyzed by MIFID uh, too, thinking about increasingly our clients are thinking uh, from a portfolio uh, uh, approach. No longer they're selecting mm -hmm. products, they're, they're actually thinking about how products are building blocks as part of their portfolio. And once again, with better data, with better uh, uh, computing power, we are able to help our clients see which part of their portfolio are effectively can be indexed and which are true alpha generating portfolio. And if the US experience is anything to go by, um, helping clients in model portfolio offering ultimately lead to greater index adoption. Mm, right. And, and Rory, what, what have you seen in terms of client use, new uses? I mean, Spider ETS, one of the first movers here. How, has you, how have uses uh, evolved, especially in the wealth management space? I think there's a couple of things building on, on, on Wee's point. There's, there's, first of all, as, as the quantum of assets in individual funds have grown, various different investors have got increased confidence in the ETF as an instrument and, as, and clearly increased confidence in the ETF category as a, as a category as such. And so you are seeing now, if you go back 10, 15 years ago for asset allocation purposes, your choices for uh, core beta building blocks were limited. You either had a basket trade or you tried to do an asset allocation strategy with futures overlays, et cetera. But now you have large liquid instruments in ETF space. They can be used by a whole variety of different investors from large institutional investors, right down to putting kind of small portfolios from mass affluent investors. And that's where we're seeing some significant migrations and changing whereby those building blocks are now being used for a whole variety of different investment management purposes, building portfolios to meet the retirement objectives, the saving objectives, college tuition fees, et cetera, objectives of various different investors, particularly in wealth space. And, and, and that's, that's something that that trend is continuing. We talked, there was an earlier panel talking about, you know, the Schwab move to zero commissions, et cetera, and, what, and TD and Ameritrade and others following that. Again, that's kind of building on that. They're, they're looking to build a wealth management business and take that further forward. And they have other ways of making up for how, the, how they've done that in terms of uh, sources of revenues. But ultimately, the Schwab business model, the TD Ameritrade business model, the online brokerage business model is migrating from a brokerage model to a wealth advisory business model with overlays and then using ETFs as a big component of that in terms of their building block strategies. I think what you're trying to get to a little bit though is also kind of you know, the, the question around let's kill the active versus passive discussion because I think we're all kind of saying it's, I think the world has moved on a little bit from that. But there is there's, there's this appetite, what is the appetite out there for active capability inside an ETF wrapper? And there's, uh, yeah, there's definitely trends taking place. Of First of all, for today, there are active funds that are wrapped in an ETF. We have some, others have them as well. And if the active manager is comfortable with the transparency proposition, i.e. delivering full disclosure of what's in the portfolio and having that delivered on a daily basis and, and real-time basis, then we can create active capabilities and wrap that inside an ETF. The challenge has historically been in the US and primarily and also other, other jurisdictions is this whole concept of non-transparent active. The active manager who's delivering alpha 
does not want to have this line-by-line -line security identification and, and transparency on an intraday basis, and they want to protect that. So they want to have some element of, can I just give disclosure once a month, once a quarter, or some aspects around that. And there has been something improved in the US, the Presidian structure, there's some, uh, a lot of kind of, I think, creativity going into how can you put that in place. Mm. Nothing has been launched as of yet, nothing has been tested, but the SEC has, after 10 years of looking at it, the SEC has started to, to look at that. And I think you know, there's definitely innovation taking place. That's kind of, and, and the active managers are pretty interested in that. When I say active managers, many of the large active houses are interested in that because they now view the ETF industry as a delivery mechanism and a distribution channel to get into wealth space. So right. if you can put active capability in an ETF and deliver that onto wealth platforms, there's an opportunity there. Challenge is going to be, first of all, the structure has got to be tested, and so there's work to be done in relation to that. But secondly, I think, um, and many of us will probably share the same observation, the, it, 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 we need to be careful that if the active manager is not confident in delivering the alpha on a sustainable basis, just putting it inside an ETF wrapper and trying to distribute it in ETF networks, that's not going to be a winning strategy. You have to have fundamentally at your core be able to deliver alpha on a consistent basis. If you do that, then we may be able to come up with techniques that give you the non-transparent active capability and then distribute that as an incremental distribution mm -hmm. channel. Right. I mean, certainly assets are, are still small compared to the rest of the industry when we look at sort of active wrappers. But I mean, certainly liquidity is, is also a driving force. I mean, people mm -hmm. want that intraday liquidity. I mean, how much has that contributed to the growth of the industry? And is that is that problematic? Is that problematic that you know perhaps there's some that shouldn't have this intraday liquidity aspect to them? I, I will then rebound on what Rory said. Actually, the ETF is a tremendous wrapper, but it is a wrapper. It is a wrapper that is enable you to access some indices. And the question of the liquidity of the ETF is coming back to the liquidity of the underlying indices. If the underlying indices is liquid, there is no liquidity concern. If the underlying liquidity of the underlying is not liquid, whatever the wrapper you will use you will have a liquidity issue. If you invest in an unliquid market, actually sometimes when the market are, I would say, fairly balanced, maybe the ETF can create you some extra liquidity. But when everyone wants to sell off, then you will come to the underlying market's liquidity. And so we should escape the debate on whether the ETF is a liquid product, unliquid product, is there a bubble or not a bubble. Well, he told you actually, and Rory told you. I mean, the ETF market is still very small compared to the asset management industry. But the ETF is a wrapper that uh, enables you to access some of the indices. And then it is, as asset manager, our financial duty as well to make sure whatever we do, we issue ETF on liquid indices, or at least we dialogue with you guys to explain to you what are the pros, what are the kind of the indices on which we uh, issue ETF, uh, what will be, I would say, the liquidity concern of some of the markets. But at the end of the day, whenever you pick up an ETF, look at the underlying markets and at the indices because that's the represent of the liquidity. Picking up on the liquidity point, and this is another area mm -hmm. uh, regulation has been helping, specifically uh, ETF in particular. If you think about uh, with MIFID requiring mm -hmm. trade reporting, uh, um, pre and post the implementation of, uh, of the regulation, we have seen on-screen liquidity for the European range inc uh, increasing by 2.5 times, which ultimately make institutional investors that want to uh, execute in larger sizes a lot more comfortable with uh, incorporating ETF as part of their, uh, as part of their portfolio. Um, and we also see as a result of that liquidity and on top of that tax efficiency. Um, EMEA range, the usage range has become increasingly popular uh, with uh, 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 Latin America clients, with APEC clients. So we're actually starting to see, even though EMEA market, ETF market kind of comes later uh, in comparison with the US market, we're starting to see this globalization of the usage range mm -hmm. helped by what's going on here. Mm. So I, I want to get and take a pause here for a second and get to one of our poll questions because I know we talked about portfolio building blocks growing as an area of usage, but I think it would be a good time to sort of ask, okay, what is the area that continues to grow? What's sort of going to drive us uh, through the next uh, leg of the ETF space? So I don't know if we can get the poll up. Um, Possibly not, <laughs> oh, sure. but, I, but I think I think this is while we're waiting for it. I think this is sort of where we can look. Okay, here we go. So, um, what areas of ETFs do we think will have the most growth? Let's say over the next decade. Um, so our answers can be thematic, fixed income, mm -hmm. portfolio building blocks, and smart beta. And I know some of these do have mm -hmm. a bit of an overlap, uh, so we'll have to keep that in mind. Um, 
smart beta seems to be sort of winning out here so far. So, I, I mean, any first reactions from you guys and, and, and the results we're seeing? Anything surprising you here? Uh, flipping all the way around, okay. actually. But these are definitely four good thematics, actually, and where mm. we also foresee the industry moving forward. Uh, we touch about the portfolio building blocks, but at the end of the day is how you combine uh, the wrapper and the different tools to make sure that you are building an efficient portfolio and how we as asset manager, ETF providers, we help you combining and giving you the tools to combine efficiently uh, those building blocks. Um, smart beta definitely is a big trend. And as Pascal said, I mean, all CIOs in the previous uh, debate, it's about isolating the idiosyncratic risk from the alpha generation and giving you some of the factor robust uh, to build up that. I think ESG is missing there, but ESG can be transversal yes. to thematic and fixed income. Thematic and looking at the mega trends rather than looking at sectors is definitely something where we do foresee demand from our clients and fixed income is a big challenge for everyone. But actually to help you finding the yield instruments and navigating through the liquidity issues that the fixed income world can I will say race to us is definitely one area of growth that we see moving forward. Roy, are you surprised that fixed yeah. income is only 13% well, there? I, I, would, I think you've got to separate in that, in that uh, a use case and a theme, a, a, a growth theme. So portfolio building blocks is a use case for ETFs. So everything, yeah. you know, thematic fixed income and smart beta will end up being used as building blocks for portfolio, uh, for various different portfolio construction techniques. Um, thematic, you know, there's definitely, you know, there's, there's lots of, um, innovation happening in thematic from kind of fundamental kind of, you know, some elements will be kind of, is ESG a theme? I, and I can go into that in a minute, you know, in terms of schools of thought between the US well, and Europe in relation to that. Smart beta. Uh, or is ESG yeah. smart beta, et cetera. Um, but then you also get into kind of, you know, thematic. Everyone wants to, you know, when is the next cryptocurrency ETF coming? And then when is the next uh, cannabis ETF coming, which is where mm -hmm. everyone's spending a lot of time in the US on exploring <laughs> that. And, you know, <laughs> we, have, we have the number of approaches we get in our US team about, you know, we want to kind of bring a cannabis ETF to market because it's a real hot market. So, so yeah, thematic is, you know, it's, it's always, that's where the nice stories come mm -hmm. from. But I do believe um, that fixed income, there's a lot happening in the fixed income ETF space. Uh, if you look at it this year in the US, there's about $198 billion of assets gathered in the US for the first nine months. There's about $70 billion gathered in Europe. The flows in the US are around 55% into fixed income. Mm. US fixed income is now about 20% of total, um, you know, the, 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 the proportion of ETF assets and fixed income is around 20% of the US, which has grown. And what's happened? Well, as um, ETF funds have grown, and as banks have withdrawn from provision of, of, of capital and making markets, et cetera, fixed income managers who 10, 15 years ago would never have traded an equity instrument that was, you know, basically a fixed income ETF is a portfolio of fixed income securities wrapped in an equity instrument traded on equity pipes and plumbing. And we had real challenges 10, 15 years ago in terms of the fixed income team or the fixed income desk traded fixed income, the ETF desk was traded on an equity desk, the two of them didn't talk to each other, et cetera. Now that's come together and you've got kind of basically multi-asset desks, trading desks. We've, we've solved the pipes and plumbing issue and then scale has started to come into the individual ETFs. So whether it's you know, high yield, HYG, or JNK from us, or BIL, or various different, you now got large liquid securities in fixed income space. And fixed income portfolio managers are looking at the liquidity aspect of those ETFs and using them for asset allocation purposes. That they, and there's more liquidity there than credit default swaps and some other instruments they had. I think going forward, as you now start to see more growth in ETF usage by f dedicated fixed income portfolio managers, you're also starting to see fixed income managers ask uh, people like us and others, can we take some of the equity techniques into fixed income space? So for example, factors in fixed income, sure. um, uh, areas of ESG in relation to fixed income, sectors in relation to fixed income. So can we actually fine tune the fixed income and universe, which today is still by and large broad aggregates to a large degree, but can we actually go deeper in terms of different slices and dices of fixed income? So I do think there's a lot happening in fixed income space. I think that will be, over the next five years, a significant growth opportunity for the industry. So, I mean, from what you're saying, does, do you think that if we were all sitting in the U.S. right now taking this poll, would fixed income be much higher? Is this, is this sort of Europe not yet catching up to some of the trends in the US? Or, or you know, why would it be? Europe's actually ahead in terms mm. of percentage of assets. Europe is around 27% mm. of, of assets in, of the trillion dollars in European ETFs today. Europe's around 27%, the US is around 20%. So Europe is actually ahead in terms of fixed income adoption in a smaller market. 
<laughs> it, it increased uh, <laughs> a <late voter. laughs> very quickly. But 100% but I agree with Rory in that I'm actually quite surprised that fixed income is the lowest scoring category. Yeah. Here, to your point about the flows that we're seeing and the market share within fixed income, it's definitely the fastest growing vanilla asset class uh, exposure within the ETF space. But a lot of innovation also still have to happen mm. to make bond managers, bond buyers comfortable with fixed income ETF. For example, some are very used to having a fixed income instrument that pays you coupon and then the principal comes back at the end of the duration. Um, so we are looking into innovations that structure an ETF similar to a bond that gives you the coupon, that gives you the principal, we call it I-bonds, and you know, a lot of innovation still need to happen for everyone to be comfortable uh, uh, about the fixed income piece. And the thematic piece, I would also kind of quickly comment in that it's actually a, 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 a demand area, specifically from the wealth advisor space, because everybody loves the story that sells. Uh, uh, so uh, we actually also see a bit of a, a greater overlap between the, uh, in this, thematic space between active and indexing in that the way that you tell a story, the way that you talk about how a thematic strategy select one company and not the other and how it leads to better performance is similar to the alpha uh, uh, story, which is why we're actually building out, we have built out a platform within uh, Blackboard that combines the active and the indexing uh, in order to bring the best uh, 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 thematic offering to clients. Right. So we only have a few minutes left, so I want to make sure I get to some of the audience questions. And I think that this one is especially pertinent, you know, given the thematic uh, uh, conversation, some of these innovations. Uh, so this question: How much faith can we have in ha uh, how much faith can we have in how indexes are created and changed, given that ETFs replicate them? And way I know we've talked about this: the sheer volume of indexes that exist. So if you're sorting through all the indexes, you're sorting through the ETFs, and I'd like to put this to everybody, but, but Wei, you know, how do you sort of sort through this, this you know, vast forest of different ETFs and indexes? Oh, well, with passion. <laughs> uh, there are lots of indexes out there, 100%, and there is a statistic that shocked me when I first learned about it. There are 70 times more mm -hmm. indices than there are stocks in the world. And if you think about the number of uh, stock pickers within our client organization, why are we not having just as many, if not more, uh, index pickers within our client uh, organization, right? So we recognize that this is a space that is fast growing, uh, uh, lots of new players as well, established player, uh, and we want to help our clients actually uh, uh, select the, I wouldn't say the right index because depending on the outcome, the, the index can be different. The outcome appropriate index for clients based on their uh, investment objectives and, 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 and mandate. And so far this year, we have clients coming to us uh, with queries that sounds exactly like a active uh, 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 portfolio manager, I like this asset class uh, uh, block, I don't like value, I'm concerned about trade, um, uh, I don't mind auto so much because it's been penalized, so this is all very active language. And they come to us and say, hey, this is what we think, can you tell us what is the index that allow me to play my asset allocation view considering all my uh, constraints, and then we would run a bunch of analysis and, and we go back with uh, proposals. So it's definitely a fast growing area. Yeah. Fanny, I mean, do you find that with clients it is an issue that they you know, struggle to pick from all of the ETF and indexes that exist out there? Oh, definitely there's been a proliferation of indices, but if you look as well of the variety of the different users you can make out of an ETF. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I'm talking about Amundi, we're in 37 countries serving institutional, sovereign distributors and retail investors. There is not one single answer to everyone's needs. So at the end of the day, there will be the right indices to your right portfolio. So it's a question of dialoguing and under understanding what are your concerns, what you want to achieve, and making sure we wrap it into the good format. Uh, very much uh, agree with what Wei said, is that we have also a duty to dialogue with you and to understand what you want to achieve. And then, as an ETF provider, we have some also responsibility and duty to make sure that whatever we issue will be liquid enough, uh, that we make as well, we make sure that the indices we select are uh, compliant to the regulation, which has been put into force for the benchmark, which is also good for the industry, uh, putting as well more forces into uh, um, the product that they've been issuing. Yeah. And Rory, I mean, it, you know, Spider ETS, this huge name in indexes, I mean, do you, do you find this issue as well? Yeah, I think as an industry, we have an obligation to be responsible. There's, there's, mm -hmm. There is a risk of kind of, as you say, index prolif proliferation and, and index spaghetti. I think we have a, an obligation to 
help educate investors to understand which index they should use for which purpose and at which point in time and what the, what the outcome of that index is going to be. I think also we have an obligation as well to discuss and talk to the various different index providers around what they're doing and the robustness of their infrastructure, and this is something that is becoming more of a regulatory focus going forward, is you know, how risk controlled, robust and resilient is S&P, is MSCI, is FTSE Russell, and some of the new players that are coming in, what have they done to really build industrial strength infrastructure such that they are calculating these benchmarks effectively, and then that those benchmarks do make sense from an investment perspective. Right. So there is, there's, 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 a, there's a trade off there, there's education in terms of the, the spaghetti as it were, and making sure that they are positioned well for investor needs, but there's also a requirement for us to talk to the providers to make sure that they are actually delivering in a risk control and industrial strength manner. Right. So that brings us to the end of our time, but just quickly, one of my favorite questions to end ETF panels on, and you only get a couple seconds to answer this because we're basically out of time at this moment. If I were to give you each 10,000 quid today, what ETF would you put it in? You can give me you can give me one of your ETFs. You can give me a broad category if you don't want to give me an exact name. Uh, but where would you put that money today? A credit okay. and gold. Credit and gold. EMMV. EMMVO. Spy. The largest, most liquid. The first one ever. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Well, please join me in thanking this wonderful panel. Thank you guys.